Abuja. Let's take a short break and where we return, it's over time to speak with our guests of the day. Ambassador Usman Seriki, former Deputy Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations, New York. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for staying with Politics Tonight. This evening, we're taking another look at ECOWAS' lingering crisis. As Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso's withdrawal from ECOWAS has flared tensions in the region, what consequences can West Africa expect? Let's get the perspective of Ambassador Usman Sergei. He is a former Deputy Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations, New York, and the one-time directing staff at the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, JOS. Tonight we're discussing Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Quinton, the ECOWAS. Ambassador, good evening to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us on Politics Tonight. The last time you were on the program was in September. It's so good to see you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. Right. So we've had this discussion once, and then it became very important for us to bring it back uh, because of this recent development. Three Francophone members of ECOWAS, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, decided to withdraw their membership of the bloc on the 29th of January. Did you see this coming? Well, uh, thank you very much. I think, you know... Um those of us who are following these issues closely, we saw this coming as one of the tactical maneuvers of the three countries in particular. But what we did not uh, see coming and what surprised us was that Guinea was not part of uh, this arrangement of withdrawal from ECOWAS. So that made it now a tripartite agreement between Mali, Burkina Faso, and uh, Niger to withdraw. We saw it coming actually as from December, when these countries form what they call the Federation of uh, Sahelian States, or uh, between the three of them, the foreign ministers met uh, 29th November, 1st December, I think, and they announced that they are going to form a political uh, uh, federation, you know, among these three countries. So the logical end to this arrangement is actually military union and then withdrawal from ECOWAS to find a niche for themselves in a semi-regional grouping that will now give them some room for maneuver and negotiation with new partners. So we saw this coming actually as, as, as far back as December. Right, but how would you describe uh, that option for the countries involved? Do you think it's in their best interest? Well, the regime leaders thought it was in their best interest to do that. As I said, it was a tactical maneuver in order to, number one, consolidate and strengthen their position at home domestically, to buy more public opinion, and to really cast a cause as the enemy number one in order to really whip up sentiments in favor of the regimes and also uh, their separate agendas. Uh, the other purpose is, of course, to create an impression of an anti-Western agenda, anti-Western perspective, anti-Western sentiment across the world to portray themselves as now they are a resistance force against Western influence, Western domination, and Western control, particularly that of France. And they are equating ECOWAS with Western control and Western domination now in Africa and in West Africa in particular. So their withdrawal is to indicate or convey to the world that we are now the good people, the good guys, fighting the bad ones, who are now in ECOWAS dancing to the tune of the Western countries. So there is a grand design behind this, uh, tactical in terms of getting immediate respite from the sanctions and also to be able to reach out to some foreign actors 
who are not on the same page with the Western countries in order to diversify their sources of revenue and also to get military support from those countries. So they know what they are doing. Uh, they have worked out these scenarios very carefully. And I think we should remember that these, the leaders of these countries, particularly Nigeria and Mali, they grew up in crisis situations in the last uh, 10 to 20 years in their countries. They are very well educated. They know what they are doing. They are very tactical and both strategic. And also they can read the, the uh, developments around the country, particularly in the domestic situation in Nigeria's case and other countries, to gauge what the sentiments will be and how they will play those sentiments in their interest. So they are, uh, as from December, I should say, to this moment, they are actually, you know, increasing in strength and advantage in commensurate with the receding influence of ECOWAS in their internal affairs. So they are actually you know, working according to plan and very systematically. Right, so Ambassador, if I get you correctly, you're saying uh, alliances with other foreign countries is the alternative you're looking for. If this is it, shouldn't this be a cause, uh, a cause of worry for ECOWAS? Well, I think, you know, this should have been uh, foreseen even uh, in August uh, when ECOWAS issued the communique in which they imposed certain uh, restrictive actions on Niger and subsequently uh, which led to deadlock in the negotiations and diplomatic settlement. Uh, in diplomacy and statecraft and international relations, just like nature, it abhors vacuum. So when you create a vacuum in a political space, there are definitely others who are willing to come in to fill that vacuum. So there are countries in the world today who are looking for friends everywhere and anyhow, and with the overtures from Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger towards them, they have found it convenient to come on board to support these countries and give them the wherewithal to survive and to maintain the regimes in power uh, by actually you know, uh, buying into this convenient idea that they are anti-Western and also they are being encycled by enemies. So please come to our aid. And I think that is what is going on today. So the regimes in these countries are very skillful in playing out the opportunities that are presented to them by the larger international situation uh, in the world that is growing anti Western feeling sentiments in the world today, in many parts of the world. And there is a growing sense of uh, alienation being felt by developing countries, particularly with economic hardships being felt in those countries. So a country that promises to give them grains free of charge, fertilizer free of charge, and military support at discounted rates will automatically be a friend and they will jump on this uh, to, to, to see these opportunities. And that is what we are seeing that is going on today. Right, but on the other hand, uh, ECOWAS has rejected uh, the action through the governments of its host nation, Nigeria. What effect can this have on the situation at hand? <coughs> Sorry, can you come again? Sorry. So I said, on the other hand, ECOWAS has rejected uh, the action through the governments of its host nation, and that's Nigeria. What effect can this have on the situation at hand? Well, I don't think it will uh, have any dramatic uh, effect on the decisions of those countries. They are acting in their capacity as the de facto uh, sovereign uh, power in those, in those countries, in those three countries, even if others don't recognize them. So they are in effective control of the country, and they are running both foreign and internal affairs in those countries, including entering agreements with some powers. That gives them the legitimacy to act in the name of their people and their country. And remember, the communique that they issued, the three countries issued, they spoke in the name of their people, you see. They didn't speak in the name of the state or the government or the country. They spoke in the name of their people. 
And that is a very tactical move, very clever, very well uh, placed move which they did. So they gave the impression now that actually as sovereignty devolves upon them from the people and the people are the wellspring of sovereignty and now they are claiming to speak on, the, on behalf of the people of those countries. So the communique they issued was very clear. It is we the people of Niger, we the people of Mali, Burkina Faso, now taking this move against the perceived enemy which is ECOWAS that for the last 40 or 50 years has retarded our development and is now conniving with Western countries, foreign countries, to deprive us of our independence, our sovereignty, our dignity, and imposing sanctions on us and creating hardship. So they have embroiled their people in this, and it has become now a sort of contention, not for legitimacy on their part, but actually a contention uh, for recognition of the de facto situation in the country, that we are in charge and you must recognize us and deal with us as we are. So that is the new uh, chess game which has been played in, in, this count, in these three countries and the larger ECOWAS region. Mm. Because of this conversation, I feel it's important for us to flash back to when ECOWAS enjoyed relative harmony among member states until this tension caused by the coup. What's your impression about how it handled the situation? Well, uh, diplomacy number one and statescraft. Statesmanship, statescraft, and diplomacy. I think this three, combination of these three factors will see us out of this uh, problem and reestablish the credibility of ECOWAS and also give a direction and focus to actions that will be needed in order to even the kill and bring back the relationship to back to where they are or at least to a semblance of normalcy in the region. Now I say diplomacy because uh, in the first place uh, all contentions between and among states must be settled diplomatically. And the threat of sanctions and threat of military force do come after the consideration of diplomatic moves and fillers that have been sent out and negotiations. It is only when they fail or when they fail to move the process forward, then issues like sanctions and other harder, more tangible uh, implications can be invoked and brought to the table. But up in issue, on August 6th or thereabout, <coughs> excuse me, we placed both the sanctions and the military options on the table. And I, I think that led to the complications of the situation and hardening of positions and perceptions and perhaps even the negative posture taken towards Nigeria by Niger in particular and then supported by Burkina Faso, Mali uh, and uh, those countries because of those uh, attitude that we took in, uh, uh, in August 6. But the meeting uh, two weeks afterwards, I think, you know, or three weeks afterwards in August, we sounded conciliatory in terms of making it clear that the military option was the last option. But that did not really mellow the situation. It, it was just like uh, an afterthought. And the regime leaders in those countries know that they are in a position, once they weather out the storm, they can entrench their position, uh, whip up sentiments, mobilize popular opinion, entrench themselves, and get new friends in other parts of the world. And their calculations are actually you know, proving right for them. Their moves are both tactical and strategic, and they are doing exactly what they have planned. And every move they make is actually you know, to check and to defeat, to some extent, the moves that has been made by ECOWAS. Mm. Uh, let me just uh, illustrate this. Now, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and uh, Niger, they left the security arrangement with France and the European Union. And today, they have assurances of security support from Russia. And they are re reaching out to other countries like China, Turkey, Iran, uh, Serbia, and, and, and some other countries, you know, to give them security support. 
and diplomatic support, even if covertly, is being given to them by Algeria and Morocco and other countries. Uh, in terms of food security, very recently Burkina Faso uh, received 25,000 tons of grains from Russia, free of charge, and they're getting fertilizer from Russia. As we speak now, the Russian Foreign Ministry and uh, the Foreign Ministries of Niger, uh, Mali, and uh, Burkina Faso are discussing security arrangements. Uh, two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, the Deputy Foreign Minister, the Deputy Defense Minister of uh, Russia visited these countries and really started a very serious, high-level uh, security discussions with these countries. Uh, only two days ago, in another context, the Foreign Minister of uh, Gambia went to Moscow to discuss uh, security arrangements. And two weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Niger, the civilian Prime Minister, Lamin Zain, uh, I think, you know, went to Moscow, you know, to discuss security arrangements. And from there, he went to, uh, I think, Serbia, and from there to Iran, and also uh, to Turkey. So they are speaking with countries to give them military hardware, military support and training, and also diplomatic cover, financial assistance, commercial opportunities, and of course, most critically, food assistance. So they are not resting, they are not sleeping, they are not sitting down in air-conditioned rooms uh, discussing uh, what their options are. They are out there sending out feelings, sending out uh, ambassadors, delegations, and very high-powered uh, individuals and uh, people of note in their communities. But Ambassador, on the other hand, yes. right. On the yeah. other hand, does this also strength, uh, strengthen the conversation about something sinister about their decision to leave the bloc? Well, um, <clears throat> I think you know we, can, we we shouldn't take it lightly. We should see see it as a very serious challenge to the survival of ECOWAS. Now, a regional bloc like ECOWAS depends on its credibility, on long-term viability, and significance on the number of membership that it had. From the inception, only one member left in 19, uh, that is 20 or 22 years ago, that was uh, Mauritania. Since then, 14 member states, we have been managing to stay together despite uh, odds and differences here and there. But this uh, exit is a very dramatic exit. It diminishes the land size of ECOWAS by about 40 or 50 percent or even more, number one. It reduces the population size of the membership and it reduces the concept of accessibility and uh, the interlocking nature of the organization in terms of bringing members of the region together. Um, so it is quite a, a serious challenge, as I see it, in terms of the cohesiveness of the regional organization. The other uh, aspect is in terms of long-term impact, if this uh, withdrawal is sustained and it stays. We don't know what forces, like you rightly raised, are behind it and what is the ultimate end objective of this uh, withdrawal and the attempt to break ECOWAS apart. Who will be, which country will suffer most? So I think, you know, we have to really do very, very intelligent analysis of this situation, particularly to find out if there are extra regional powers behind this move in order to bring down ECOWAS and create chaos and confusion and mayhem in our region. Whatever it is, if insecurity spreads in the Sahel region, and also there are discordant notes in this region in terms of cooperation between and among states, our position in Nigeria will be very precarious. We are already facing very serious uh, internal security issues, and when we no longer have these buffer zones and friendly countries surrounding us in terms of our security, then matters will become very serious, and we need to really take uh, these issues into consideration. Beyond that, uh, issues of control of the river Niger, for instance, the use of the waters of the river Niger, 
and also the Trans-Saharan Pipeline, Trans-Saharan Railway, Trans-Saharan Highway, uh, the optical uh, pi uh, you know, fiber lines, and all these envisaged products will be jeopardized. So it is very important that this issue is taken very, very, very seriously by the federal government so that we can just nip it in the bud and do not allow it to escalate to a point whereby this breaking away from ECOWAS becomes entrenched and it serves as an example for other countries to follow. It is a very serious development. Absolutely. So, uh, Ambassador, let me bring in this angle, and I'm sure you're not hearing it for the first time. If in 2020, Mali fell under military control, followed by Burkina Faso in 2022, but they were not suspended from ECOWAS. But the 2023 coup in the Republic of Niger attracted sanctions. Many see this as double standards. Yes, indeed. That, that uh, feeling has actually uh, emerged. That, that narrative has emerged. It has gained currency and it has actually gained momentum to the point whereby uh, even our own intellectuals, our own civil society members and journalists and others have been emphasizing that, the double standards of ECOWAS. But you have to look at it in, 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 in a different perspective, in a different context. You know, in those countries, in Guinea and Mali and others where these uh, coups and others took place, there were some undercurrents of political uh, discontents because of regime, extension, uh, constitutional amendments and so forth that affected those countries. But in Niger, the situation was different. Actually, the country was making progress democratically. The civil society space was being opened up. The economy was improving, Life, uh, lifestyle of people, the livelihood was getting better, the government was getting on top of the security situation. By every yardstick, the government of Mohamed Bazoum was actually performing very well. And then suddenly, his own head of the, his own security toppled him and detained him and truncated the constitution and the entire process. And because of that, <coughs> the ECHO, sorry, decided that they have to now draw a line somewhere in order to prevent this becoming the norm in West Africa. And I think because of the action they took, particularly because of the firm position taken by Nigerian government, we have seen how uh, two or three attempts have been made in Guinea-Bissau, and recently in Sierra Leone, and uh, maybe one other country, to take over the government, but they did not succeed because of the consequences that may entail in their taking over of the government. And because of the resolute position of ECOWAS, led by Nigeria under its chairmanship today, about zero tolerance to military takeover, those takeovers did not succeed. So I think there is a potency in terms of the preventive nature of the posture of ECOWAS that they took towards the uh, change of uh, leadership, the unconstitutional, forceful change of leadership in Niger. And I think, you know, that was something that uh, was the right thing to do at that time. But the handling of the uh, approach towards the Niger coup in the aftermath now leaves some sort of... Uh, things to be desired in terms of the diplomacy and the follow-up actions. Apart from that, I don't see the double standards, you know, that people are referring to in terms of treatment of Niger and the two other countries. Mm. Uh, the three countries also talked about unfairness, injustice, and intolerance, but we will get into that uh, when we return from this break. Tonight we're discussing Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, quitting ECOWAS, and I've been speaking with Ambassador Usman Seriki, former Deputy Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations. I'll take a break now, and I will be right back. We'll stay with politics tonight.
every second, every minute, every hour and every day. Time doesn't just take away. It's a countdown to political decisions that shape our world. This country must move in. Imagine the impact these decisions have on our lives. Some are consequential, others may leave us intrigued or baffled. You will have no better friend and partner than Nigeria. Step in and feel the frenzy like never before. Join me every weekday for an hour of fact-finding interviews but questions caught to the core. What does Tinubu has that other 17 candidates do not have? I will dig in to get to the heart of issues, from local politics to global insight. Join me as I unearth the power plays, jaw-dropping revelations and the unfiltered truth. This isn't just politics, it's unraveling the stories that matter. Brace yourself for politics tonight, every weekday at 8 p.m., where every decision echoes along the corridors of our lives. Politics tonight, only on CBC News. So much for staying with us. For the past 30 minutes, I've been speaking with Ambassador Usman Serki, is the former Deputy Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations, New York, and is also one time Director of Staff at the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. Good just tonight, uh, we're discussing Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, quitting the ECOWAS. Ambassador, thank you so much for staying with us on politics tonight. Like I uh, pointed out before we went on that break, the three Francophone countries accused ECOWAS of unfairness, injustice, and intolerance since their suspension. Do you agree with them on this? No, I don't. ECOWAS has been fair uh, to them, actually, in terms of stabbing off military intervention and also in terms of allowing members to decide on uh, how best to deal with those countries. Because of the flexibility shown by ECOWAS, Benin Republic decided to actually lift some of the sanctions against Niger by allowing the import of food and other things into the country through the ports uh, in Benin Republic. So the idea of uh, ECOWAS being unfair uh, you know, uh, very giving them a very brutal treatment and things like that was just simply to mobilize internal sentiments and internal uh, support from the people and to create this disaffection against an external entity that they have created as the enemy of the regimes of their countries. Uh, ECOWAS did not, uh, for instance, you know, stop them from actually uh, engaging in diplomatic activities with other countries or even seeking military uh, support and equipment and uh, assistance from other countries. Otherwise, ECOWAS could have gone to those capitals and tell, told them, look, what you are doing goes against the spirit of our regional uh, arrangement and against the sanctions that we impose uh, on this country. So please don't entertain these countries. ECOWAS did not do that, to the best of my knowledge. So ECOWAS is simply adhering to its protocols, adhering to the decision of the heads of state and government of the Commission in terms of the observance of the norms and legality of the decision of the community. It did not go beyond that to ascribe to itself certain extrajudicial powers to deal with these countries. It deals with these countries on the basis of the decisions of the heads of state and government and on the basis of the instrument of ECOWAS. Even when they announce their withdrawal or exit from ECOWAS, ECOWAS in a very mature and recent way said, we have not received formal communication from these countries informing us of their exit. As such, to all intents and purposes, they are still part of us. That was how conciliatory and understanding and forthcoming ECOWAS was. So what they were claiming as uh, 
uh, unjust and unfair treatment is grandstanding towards actually, you know, mobilizing internal support and also playing to the gallery in terms of attracting the attention of those countries outside our region who are sympathetic to their cause, which is to say that they are now the champions of an anti-Western struggle in Africa in order to gain sympathy and support from those countries. So ECOWAS approach, especially ECOWAS media engagement and diplomatic outreach should be as tactical and at the same time as strategic as these country, three countries are doing. So Nigeria too, should I think, you know, look at the terrain very carefully and see diplomatically how it is going to, you know, counter these maneuvers which are now taking place among these three countries to neutralize actually, you know, the decisions of ECOWAS and even possibly to lead to the breakup of this uh, regional arrangement. Right. So it is evident that this uh, withdrawal is already having significant repercussion on the stability of the region. What will you advise ECOWAS to do at this time? Well, I think number one is to limit the impact of this withdrawal so that other countries do not see it as a cheap way of gaining uh, access to the sympathies of other countries outside in order to gain some advantages which they could not derive from ECOWAS. And the second one is actually to, for ECOWAS to wake up to the reality of the 21st century that our region is a region of instability, stretching from Mali right down, right up to the Sudan in the east. And to look at the mechanisms of peace, uh, internal security, counterterrorism, and so forth, very, very seriously, at the highest level, and to work with other regional organizations and international organizations to see that even if we do not eliminate insecurity entirely in this region, we have minimized it to the extent whereby it does not come and become an existential threat to our countries. And the third one is that because of the growing population <coughs> excuse me, in the Sahel region and the escalating climate change, the impacts of climate change and other environmental problems, we have to attend to the needs of the people in this region very, very seriously. Food security, water security, health, education, housing, income, employment, and so forth are very, very critical uh, issues that are in very dire uh, shortage or deficit in this region. So ECOWAS should live up to its founding principle of economic integration at another level, at the 21st century level, by really encouraging member states to spend more on social services, on human development services, in order to reduce tension in the region and to bring about sustainable development. And there are a lot of things that they could do. For instance, harnessing of the resources in the region. The regime in Niger, for instance, is saying that for the last six years, France was virtually stealing their uranium and paying them pittance. Today, because of their actions, they are claiming that uranium, the price has gone to up to 200 from $1 or something they are receiving to $200, you know, per, you know, the, that they are getting per, per, per ton or thereabout. So it is very important for us to see how uh, we market our resources and what sort of revenues do we give, get from these resources and how and where we channel them. Uh, lastly, the issue of uh, cooperation between the states and among the states, member states, to come to a common understanding on what security and insecurity mean in the region and to tackle it collectively. We cannot go individually to deal with these issues because of the complexity of the situation, the scarcity of opportunity and resources, and also the adversity that is facing the Sahel region is just too great for the member states individually to deal with them. So ECOWAS has to really wake up, and we have to really fine-tune our diplomacy in Nigeria and bring the capacity to deal with crisis, with emergency, to a higher level 
whereby we will be able to, on our own, to lead the ECOWAS down the path of constructive engagement and diplomacy rather than actually you know, allowing things to get out of hand. And in the end, we look for support from outside to come and help us deal with this situation. We should be the primary lead in settling issues in ECOWAS region. Ambassador, let's talk about uh, international law. Do you think ECOWAS has the authority to deny the countries the right to withdraw from the regional bloc since membership is voluntary? Well, um, the articles in uh, <coughs> Article, I think, 81 to 91, if you look at them carefully, they have made provisions for, number one, giving sufficient notice of one year of the withdrawal and then consultation with other members in order to withdraw. The peremptory nature of the withdrawal of this country poses a challenge to ECOWAS in terms of the norms of international law. Under international law, you cannot commit an illegality and then justify it by the legality of your conduct. No. You justify your action based on the provisions of the instruments that are guiding the establishment of the organization that you belong to. So, of course, independent member states have the sovereign right to belong to an organization and also to withdraw. But I don't think the ECOWAS Treaty has given the provision uh, for easy, you know, just like that, for you to declare, send a letter to the commission you have withdrawn, and then you just go your way. There are procedures in terms of doing so. There is a period that you have to observe and to discuss the mode of withdrawal, particularly in terms of if there are certain uh, objectives or conditions that you are supposed to meet and you have not met them, then it is incumbent upon you to meet those conditions. So generally, under provisions of international law, there are clauses of withdrawal from a treaty from an agreement or from an organization. You can do that. Uh, yeah. The UK, based on the Brexit referendum, they withdrew from the European Union because of the availability of that facility for them to do so. So it is not a new thing for member states, one or two or a couple of them, or even more, to withdraw from an organization. But there are laid down procedures of doing so. But the mm. what heightened people's imagination and concern is the way they did it in terms of presenting a cause itself as a block, as the evil force against which they are fighting, which is really a, uh, a wrong impression that they created in order to justify their action. For the last 50 years, a cause has been a force for good uh, in West Africa and the larger African space. For them today to turn around, to cast a cause in the light of the evil force, I think is unjustified and unacceptable. A cause maintained the stability of this region. It fostered the principle of free movement of people, goods and services. It brought about the notion of a, a, a sense of community, a sense of oneness. And ironically, it was in Niger in... Uh, I think 2017 or thereabout, was it 2007 or so, this idea of echoes of the people, you know, came into being. That is, to transit from echoes of states or member states to echoes of peoples. It was in Niamey that uh, concept came up. And we are now actually, you know, moving towards that in terms of getting our people integrated without the encumbrances of state controls in the lives and the affairs of the people. And suddenly, you have military hunters who now decide that that arrangement is not in their interest and they have to terminate it and bring it to an end. What right, for, for instance, do they have to deny their people to engage in trade with other ECOWAS countries? What right do they have to deny their people free movement from Niamey to Dakar or from Miami to Cotonou or to Lagos. They don't have that right, but they are creating this right, uh, arrogating this right to themselves in terms of convenience in order to really 
bring to a, a situation into, into being whereby they can justify their legitimacy to control the country and continue to be in power without any external pressure brought to bear on them by telling their people, we are working for you, we are protecting your dignity, your sovereignty, your independence, and your interests. So allow us to do that, and those are the enemies, we are going to deal with them. So I think we have to wake up to this reality. It's not all roses and scents that we are seeing. But, but Ambassador, the procedure of withdrawal was not adhered to by these countries. What do you, why do you think this happened? And there is this question of undermining the sovereignty of member states in the article. What's your view on this? Well, uh, I still, you know, in my opening remarks when I started this interview, I drew your attention to their meeting in uh, uh, December, three of them, foreign ministers of the three countries, Niger, Mali, and uh, Burkina Faso, to declare the creation of a federation, you know, among themselves, among the three countries. And immediately after that, they set up a security structure, a military security structure. So it's a premeditated pre action, the withdrawal, based on arrangements they have already put in place. And now they are speaking, they withdrew in the name of their people. That is the difference. They did not now say we are withdrawing as a country or as a state, but we are withdrawing in the name of our people, in the name of the peoples of our country. So what they are saying is actually, now they are extricating themselves completely and even their populations completely. So they are giving a fait accompli to the rest of the world and to the rest of the continent of Africa and particularly to ECOWAS that they have nothing to do with us anymore. And that is a problem. You cannot separate our people. You cannot create distinctions based on convenience and expedience in terms of the interests of a ruling junta. It is just historically not feasible. And even in future, this should not be allowed to stand. There is no distinction between the people of Nigeria and Nigeria. There is no distinction between the people of Burkina Faso and people of uh, Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana or, or Benin Republic. We have to be conscious of this fact. We should not allow the short-term interests, the survival instincts of the military regimes in these countries to, break, to bring about a permanent state of conflict, a permanent state, uh, state of distrust and uh, hostility between us and our brethren in those countries. I think our diplomacy should work towards that. And more importantly, our information management is far more inferior and weaker to the ones that the regimes are employing in those countries. They are portraying themselves as revolutionaries, as people who are out there to fight colonialism, imperialism, and also to, uh, to get back the dignity and independence of their countries. But in reality, what they are doing is fighting us, their own brothers and sisters in this country and other West African countries, first and foremost. So we have to wake up to this reality and know how to deal with it in a very constructive harmonious and diplomatic way. Right. Uh, as we wrap up tonight, Ambassador, what do you think that Nigeria as the big brother should do at this moment? Well, I think we should continue to persevere along the lines of diplomacy. Uh, the opportunity or actually the moment for uh, very hardline posture has passed. You know, those uh, from August to September, we could have taken any hardline decisions and imposed it, but that window has closed. So now I think whether we are prepared for it or not, we have to look at the diplomatic route and follow it to the end. And that is the most important aspect. And I right. think, you know, we are up to, the, up to it. We can do it if we put our minds to it. Uh, the important thing, I pointed out the... Uh, that Guinea did not join the three in leaving ECOWAS. And that gives an, a diplomatic opening for us through Conakry Ambassador, to really so bring this uh, matter to an end. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you thank so you. much. I've been speaking with sure. Ambassador Usman okay. Serke, former Deputy Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations. Thank you so much for joining us.
on politics tonight. It is an honor. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching. That marks the end of today's episode of Politics Tonight. But the conversation continues from here. Get in touch with us on X at Citizen News NG and at Olaju Moke O using the hashtag Politics Tonight. We're also on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TVC News Nigeria. I am Olaju Moke Olatuji. See you tomorrow.